When we consider that our Creator put us all on this planet without any restrictions whatsoever, and supplied us with all the food and raw materials that we need for a paradise here, it becomes pretty obvious that under our abuses of this bounty, we humans are a pretty mixed up species. And for thousands of years now, we've built up great civilizations. And after we build them up, war and turmoil have invariably destroyed all of these advances. And then time and nature have once again cleaned up all of our failures. Well, I'm Al Fry, and in the following presentation, I'm going to show you where many of our problems came from and how our dominion systems here have enslaved us for thousands of years and to some degree how we can escape much of this dominion and domination. Well, to start at the beginning and gain a firm foundation, we should probably point out how we humans differ from all other life forms that surround us here on this planet. When you view animals, for example, you'll find that they're all living in a state of contentment and are guided by instinct. Unless there's a danger to their environment, they'll graze peacefully or play with one another in a state of affection or joy. We humans, on the other hand, have lost the use of our natural instinct and for the most part are miserable and almost completely lacking in any joy. And there are a number of ancient hermetic manuscripts which explain what happened to change our species. But the most accepted source for today's civilized Westerners is the account given in our Bible. And there, it tells of an alien intelligence and his followers who were once banished to Earth for trying to proselytize and set up dominion systems in the universe. And as they were banished to this planet and set up kingdoms here over the higher forms of animals, they began to breed with Homo sapien, or the highest form of animal here on this planet. And since each species is in a perfect state within its own tribe line and instinct, when this interbreeding took place, there was a break from perfection. And the Homo sapien had some major changes in the brain neuron patterns and functioning. All of a sudden, there was an alien intelligence concerning technology and dominion in the DNA patterns of the humans here. And no longer did our species feel content to live off the bounty of nature and in a simple animal style. And the offspring of this God-man mating began to be discontent and he was always questing toward more material things. Well, in the Bible, of course, this event is simplified. It's the Garden of Eden story, and the eating of the fruit of knowledge. And if you go back to the original translations, you can find that an apple was never mentioned. And it was simply a case of our being cast from a state of animal perfection. By being contaminated with a new mind circuitry, we were forced to toil by the sweat of our brow. And when you compare the few remaining jungle primitives scattered around the world with the civilized races, you can get an idea of the type of change that took place back then. Many jungle tribes 
gather enough food in a few hours to supply them with food for a whole week. And only we civilized humans toil at jobs we dislike just to keep a state-controlled roof over our head and eat our junk food. And why we continue to toil in such a high degree of servitude is due to this brain circuit change and very sophisticated system of domination set up by the early gods and lords and rulers from what we would call the alien intelligence systems here. And when these Elohim, as some call them, this term meaning plural gods in the original translated form, first found themselves in charge over thousands of lazy natives, they found it difficult to control and manage these natives at first. They used many fear tactics. But fear was only effective to a point, and soon the natives would go back to the lazy jungle life, if not constantly pushed and threatened. Later, as these rulers became more efficient, they thought up more efficient control systems and began to brainwash humans with self-enslaving systems. Religion and the hellfire was a favorite tactic. The priest would promise the people later rewards or punishments in direct proportion to their obedience to the rulers and the state. And burning in an other world fire was a priestly concept put to use long before the later medieval church put a revised hellfire concept to use. Well, the early rulers at first had large families and armies to help them control vast areas of the planet. Later, after much trial and error, it was found that money was the most efficient unit value control system. With money, they could buy armies or any other means of control and power. And today, the DNA and soul patterns of these ancient rulers and gods are still in bodies of humans and still controlling the majority through sophisticated banking and money systems. Well, since DNA patterns are carried over through interbreeding, almost all of the races today have some degree of this alien technological intelligence contaminating them and constantly causing an inner struggle. And this alien mind circuit will send a thought to the human brain concerning a desire to cheat and use their fellow humans. And at the same time, a more humanitarian thought will flash in the brain, urging the human to treat their fellows with honesty and understanding. And this conflict thought pattern goes on constantly in the civilized or contaminated homo sapien. Those who follow the urgings of the so-called satanic promptings are later to taste a sample of their own medicine through a simple law of the creators. This creator's law is called karma. The workings of this law are very simple. After cheating others, for example, we usually get cheated in a similar way ourselves, just to get an inner feeling of what it feels like. And eventually, our inner soul tapes learn the hard way what is ethically wrong, and we get a so-called conscience, which constantly lets us know what is right and wrong for us. As you can observe, the aborigine races that haven't interbred with the civilized races have an instinct as to taking care of the aged and infirm and such in their tribes to a point. They simply 
can't comprehend our desire to chase after power, money, and domination over others. And they usually only fight for fun or to protect their tribal purity or survival. And as I say, the fun of squabbling, just like animals. And it's only we civilized humans will go and fight for our rulers or on foreign soil for very few good reasons. And even then, the rulers usually stir up patriotism through propaganda. Why, as the early gods made up languages and religious foundations, they directed all of these systems toward domination of the individual's choice and happiness. They realized that content people seldom worked as hard as frustrated people. Their goal then was to push humanity upward to greater knowledge. So the paradise that they envisioned through technology and brain control would become a reality. They tried to keep the human a machine as much as possible. And to do this required systems that would stop emotions. In languages like English, they developed with no distinction between the various types of love. And as a contrast, you'll find even the most primitive races have words for the various forms of love and emotions. Yet these new dominion systems were designed to limit and squelch all affection and joys. Eventually, they felt that our species could be forced to gain high-level wattage and could rule at the head of sophisticated systems, which were sterile me mechanistic utopias. There are dozens of secret organizations and world dominion systems with great power today have this one world paradise goal is an ideological foundation for them. And this is why many men of wealth and power today are drawn into taking away the freedoms of the majority. In their thoughts and motives, they feel that there's no other way to bring humanity to such a goal than through force and domination. They feel that humanity would still prefer to sit under banana trees and enjoy themselves rather than to upgrade technology and the great dream. And they are correct in many respects, of course. The vast majority of persons on earth don't care about pushing themselves to an early grave for some ideological ruler schemes. As a result, most of them are forced into working within the systems or they're systematically exterminated. Millions of jungle dwellers and unproductive natives were liquidated or allowed to starve. And the world rulers simply don't view many of these third worlders as useful and productive in their long-range goals. And sometimes even more civilized races and groups get completely wiped out when they go against the various rulers and state. A look through history will only touch the top of these deliberate genocide sweeps. For an example, when an inner core of some 80,000 communists took over Russia and her 150 million people, six million farmers were liquidated by starvation when they did not go along with the new collective farming policies of the communists. And today we have hundreds of thousands of Indians in the jungles of Latin America being liquidated and again, the controlled press ignores such outrages. 
to concentrate on the minor gossip stories of the world. The third world people like this sugarcane cutter are working for slave labor wages in many areas of today's world. Classic examples today include the Brazilian jungles which are being slashed and burned. One percent of the people there own almost 50 percent of the land in these Latin countries. And as the natives are killed off, this one percent move in for the settlers and often this land is burned out and eroded in less than 10 years so it's no longer usefully producing. And with the major news media systems within the hands of a tight inner circle of manipulators, today's enlightened and educated people are very little better educated than they've ever been. And kings and tyrants always threw the dissenters into dungeons to shut them up. Today, the history texts get watered down and censored, and school teachers stay within a tight framework or they lose their jobs. And dissenters and radicals are tolerated only if they stay small. And the moment they gain power, they're dealt with in more sophisticated ways. Tax dissenters and agitators are often audited and stripped of their livelihoods and property by the IRS. And if there's the least deviation from the normal behavior of a subjugated citizen, there can be an assault by the mental health systems. And so-called mental illnesses are impossible to define in a legal way under constitutional foundations. So it's easy to have almost any agitators leveled and labeled with pseudo-scientific illnesses and locked up. And once locked up, there are dozens of drugs and methods which can alter the mind components and turn these non-conformists into docile pussycats. So let's look at some of the genocide which has taken place behind the guise of mental health. Well, the birth of psychiatry as a tool of control by the state probably started in the late 1930s by the Nazi Germans. Hitler's physician, Karl Brandt, was one of the heads of a euthanasia program for psychiatric inmates. And from the records at the Nuremberg trials after the war, many feel 300,000 persons were liquidated before the war was over. And in the majority of cases, the victims were recommended for euthanasia by a state psychiatrist who evaluated them first. And here we see Hermann Goring, in the center of this picture, is the leader of some of these tactics. Well, if the persons were draining money from the state and could not take care of themselves, they were often liquidated. As workers and slave labor pools were needed to run the war plants, only the insane and unproductive got gassed toward the end of the war. And the Nuremberg records show that the euthanasia programs of the period was endorsed by the majority of the noted psychiatrists of the country. And as the deaths increased, the infamous gas ovens were resorted to. Thousands got worked to death before getting burned to ashes. Gypsies, Slavs, Poles, gays, and Jews alike got cremated. Well, only the Jews, of course, later made a big issue out of all of this and put pressure to bear to get sympathy and payments later. Germany paid millions to Israeli Jews over the years, and some estimate about half. The recipients didn't even legally deserve these funds. Well, about the same time Hitler's regime was doing away with persons who weren't an asset to the state, our own U.S. psychiatrists were learning to kill a psyche and leave the body alive. 
From 1946 to 1955, some 50,000 persons in the United States got a lobotomy at the hands of our mental health experts. And in this operation, an ice pick was thrust up through the upper eyelid, and the instrument was moved from side to side to cut off the connections of the frontal brain lobe. Well, patients often lost their drive and initiative after these procedures. They often ended up like zombies. And the man who thought up this procedure, Igis Moniz, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine and was later beaten to death by a victim who rebelled against his life being ruined by this state hero. Well, even as barbaric as this ice pick method was, there is an estimated thousand persons a year getting their brains mutilated even up to the 80s. Now, later, lasers and sound waves are found to do the job very neatly and were often used in this more modern world of ours. Now, during this same period, the United States leaders found that political enemies could be dealt with through the more powerful mental health laws that were easily passed. Roosevelt had men like Ezra Pound locked up. And if you recall, Ezra Pound was constantly antagonizing Roosevelt and pointing out the unconstitutional tactics that Roosevelt used to get his way. So he spent 10 years in an institution as a result. Well, the CIA, which had come into being as an emergency wartime agency, quickly started using psychological mind manipulation techniques a few years after Truman superseded Roosevelt. Truman was supposed to disband them, but he didn't. And the CIA quickly formed into a personal police force for the international elite. And a lot of this has been recorded. A man named Alfred B. Glazier was an in intelligence during the war and learned much of this and put out a tabloid newspaper during the 60s, of which you see an example here. It exposed the CIA for what they were and showed the lists of CIA agents and businesses in the United States and over the world. And no sooner had this issue hit the stands then thousands of dollars worth of news racks all across Southern California were destroyed or came up missing. And this is another example of censorship. It was a paperback book put out on the CIA. And the CIA tried to suppress this book. And it showed how the CIA were... squeezed out of the control of Congress like they should have been, and they have billions in hidden budgets. And they can well be called the most dangerous and despicable undercover manipulation agency in the world. And when the world bankers want to topple a government or leader, they evidently simply use the CIA to do so. Many of heads of state and informed persons of the world are well aware of this. Well, in the early 50s and 60s, the CIA became pretty expert in mind manipulation techniques. And under emotionless psychiatrists, they tested drug after drug on helpless prisoners and other inmates of institutions. And there are many books and articles that detail these experiments. And this is a classic example by Boward. Well, by the 70s, the chemical cartels were getting huge profits through the sale of tranquilizers like Thorazine. Four million prescriptions a year kept patients drugged into docility in the late 70s. And this added up to almost a $2 billion industry by the 80s. Well, as the rebels and the other socially undesirables got lobotomized and drugged, 
even the socially dependent on the lower ladder of society eventually got the attention of the mental health experts. New York Times, for example, reported that in 1980 there were 4,000 persons that had been sterilized under the guise of correcting a medical problem in a single facility in Lynchburg, Virginia, and how many other thousands were sterilized across the nation could probably never be estimated accurately. And but the time the 1980s came along, virtually any person who was state supported or radically different from the majority were at the mercy of the mental health operations. And they're tricked into incriminating themselves through talking therapies. And if the poisonous mind warping drugs don't modify them back to submission to state normalcy, they're shocked or lobotomized in submission under new therapy, singulotomies, amygdalotomies. These are new names for the same old destruction techniques, the brain. Oh. Hundreds of millions of dollars of government grants have encouraged the same psychiatric approach that was begun by the depraved Nazi regime under Hitler. And according to the directory of the American Psychiatric Association for the mid-70s, there were at least 63 members that once worked under the brutal Nazi system during World War II's Germany. Carl Jung, you might remember, most of his ideologies were used and honored in Germany contemporary America. His ideologies were number one, along with Freud. Well, as it became important to take the self-determination and independence away from the pampered Americans, the world's elite manipulation experts began to tighten up on the freedoms. You remember that the unions had erased the financial dependence of Americans they had once had for the industrialists and their manipulative systems. So a way was found, and that way was to take away the value of the U.S. dollar. No longer would the money be backed up with gold or silver, something of worth and substance. Inflation and unconstitutional taxation were used, along with sharp banking usury systems, to keep Americans tied to this system. Here in 1923, picture of police taking a truckload of members of the industrial workers of the world to jail, and this was typical. There were 300 members this organization that were arrested, thousands of others dissenters. Well, once women were found to be productive in World War II factories, the industrial lowered the pay of men later to the point that both men and women had to work in order to survive. By the 80s, most Americans were not much better off than the Europeans who had long been under the tighter control of the one world leaders. And this is a very tragic view of all the bloodshed that occurred at the last century for fair wages in our nation. And as late as the 20s and 30s, Americans were getting hauled off and arrested for organizing against the industrial giants who do no work, simply push paper around. And the workers of the world had a rough time getting their freedom and what little freedom they had up to World War II. Few of the complacent Americans today realize what a struggle our ancestors had in our nation to gain what freedoms we have today. Occasionally, citizens are outraged at the tactics of the psychiatric and mental health bureaucracy and start movements to curtail these abuses. And then an example was a man named Shaboeski, who'd been abused by the system as a child and single-handedly educated the public to abuses in Berkeley, California area. 
after getting a ballot and ordinance against electroshocking. He passed by the people of Berkeley, and then he got a taste of local state power. The furious psychiatric associations got a local judge to rule against this lawfully instituted ordinance. Shabasinski was a son of a mental patient, so was considered state property by New York Bellevue authorities as a minor. Social workers said he was too passive if he played with girls, and when he picked uh, neighbors' flowers, he was hostile. So after enough symptoms on his books, he was treated at six to continuous shock treatments. He wanted to die repeatedly, but he could only cry and live to endure more torture and blackness until he finally spent 10 years locked away like an animal. And the authorities told him he had to learn to adjust. So he endured his entire youth going from nightmare to nightmare. There are hundreds of similar first-person cases that have been given before actual hearings. Psychiatric atrocities concerning drugs are no less depressing. Janet Gotkin wrote a book on her experiences. And she tells of being in a drug prison for years under the care of juvenile caseworkers. She couldn't speak or think clearly. She was constantly hungry and gaining weight and shook so badly she could hardly scribble. Well, after Thorazine, she was dosed with Hamadrin and became so hooked on that that her muscles would tighten into painful knots if she missed a dosage. I might add that some patients got drug-induced diseases which made their features grotesque. Well, older women who don't conform to the roles of a good wife and mother are favorite candidates for the control tactics of the state mental operations. Here's an early example of what Dorothea Dix found in the 1800s. Well, even when abuses do come to the light, the suits against psychiatrists seldom hold up because only fellow psych colleagues can give expert testimony. And like doctors, very few will spook out against their brethren. It was not until the early 80s that women, generally speaking, got together to try to become liberated. The late 70s and 80s. And the state systems typically want emotions kept under control. And psychiatric therapy on women is a very efficient mechanism for social control. And emotions are treated as an illness. And drugs are the favored treatment. Controlling the medical schools and journals, of course, is the drug industry. And with their grants and advertising, they walk hand in hand with the state leaders who are in turn walking to the tune of the hidden elite, as we might call them. And the Rich and the Super Rich was a well-known book that details some of the manipulations run by this hidden elite, and other books detail the same scenario. It wasn't that difficult to find the proof. And how these elite push these mental health programs is a little more difficult to find information on. But the results are obvious. How many suicides and drug-related deaths that occur under such mental health therapists is hard to estimate far greater than most persons suspect. Usually the only time these deaths hit the media is when a celebrity is involved. Robert Kennedy's son, David, died of Mellorill and Demerol and a cocaine combination. And Ernest Hemingway, you might uh, remember, blew his brains out after getting some shock therapy treatments. Hundreds of similar cases remained locked away in silent files, though. The physician's desk reference lists adverse effects for virtually all of the new mind control drugs. And many alter the body temperature regulation. 
and patients die from hearts and heat stroke and a number of other ailments. About 20% of those who got the well-known neuroleptic malignant syndrome died. And the sudden death phenomenon is frequently still not understood. Many other deaths come from drug-induced epileptic seizures, drug-induced blood clots and bone marrow poisoning, tardive dysphyxia, which can disfigure patients, as we mentioned before, permanently. The cases are not too extreme. And of course, suicide, which can come out of the drug depression. Thousands of deaths from psychiatric drugs were listed in one study by the National Institute of Drug Abuse a few years ago. Remission rates for mental patients are rising yearly. Drugs are failing, and the experts just won't stop this assault. And the death rate from cutting up the brain was once estimated to be as high as 6%. But today, lasers and sound machines have cut this down considerably. Very few magazines or tabloids will touch these cases. Now here's a case of a woman that was rescued after years in a mental hospital. She said she'd be either a vegetable or dead if she hadn't been rescued from a state mental hospital by an outside person that learned about the bizarre problem. In the article, she described how she was put away for refusing to send her nine-year-old daughter by a previous marriage to school. And they taught her at home, and then she and her husband were hauled away, put in a state mental hospital on the grounds that they suffered from delusional religious beliefs. Well, there are an estimated 159,000 people in mental hospitals today. Who knows how many of them undergo the same problems and treatments or somewhat similar rebellions against the state and the state systems. Due to a variety of causes, many of today's children are being labeled handicapped, impaired, or mentally retarded. And often such handicaps are brought on by a stressful environment, an extreme reaction to allergies or food additives or a dozen other easily traceable causes. Rebellious, non-conforming children are often sent to special classes where they're passed up by their former classmates and they soon lose what confidence they had and they eventually wind up under the control of mental health systems and modify them into subnormal conformity at any cost. It's rather interesting to note that the big corporations like the phone companies and thrift shops can often get these mentally retarded laborers at only a fraction of the minimum wage. And if protesting parents try to yank their faltering kids out of school to teach them themselves, the state often comes along and takes the children away just like Hitler did to the use of Germany. The woman that we just mentioned previously had the same experience. Well, it's very easy to get committed in most states. Mental health procedures and acts usually indicate that persons who can't take care of themselves can be sent before a committee hearing or a commitment hearing, so to speak. They're bound by a petition or commitment by virtually any person who is an upright citizen. It means angry husbands, mental health workers, or even disgruntled landlords can start the action. And if the individual has no money, the public defenders will often act on what they think is the best for the person. And in most cases, the victims are locked up after a hearing. They simply can't defend themselves correctly. Well, according to the psychiatric establishment's own records, there's one in five adults that are mentally ill in the 80s. 
And according to them, virtually all of the homeless persons in our nations are mentally disturbed. And if they had their way, the taxpayer would be forced to fund treatment for these jobless nonconformists. Whether the next step would follow the nasty patterns of euthanasia is an interesting speculation on all this. What we do find today is typical treatment by a social worker aiming at getting the victims to adjust to their plight rather than confront the cause, which is all too often the state and state domination controls, of course. Just typical of all this today was psychological counseling given to victims of the Three Mile Island nuclear meltdown disaster so they could adapt to the nuclear world of pollution, birth defects, and technological progress today. Well, the best protection against being locked up like this, of course, has always been to go along with conformity and obedience to the state. But unfortunately, those who love freedom and retain their ethics and principles tend to confront and fight the state, states and tyrants. Usually, always must use dominion tactics and free thinkers and rebels are a threat to dominion systems. And to all nonconformists in the state, the worst possible move is to confide in any professional person working for the state. Even mates have proved the undoing of some of these rebels. Under the laws of 30 states today, a spouse can be locked up without court order if his mental condition seems to create an emergency. There have been many husbands hauled off to a hospital kicking and struggling because of a vengeful wife. Later they face the wife and her doctor, lawyer, hostile physicians, and a judge at a sanity hearing. And of course the same is true, vice versa. The American Civil Liberties Union has a massive file of cases in which people will railroad it into mental institutions without just cause. Marital grudges, neighborhood disputes have been responsible for many of these lockups. Well, various states differ, but many states allow any citizen or friend to apply for your lockup to a police officer or judge. Many states won't even guarantee you a, a later psychiatric checkup once you've been convicted at a short hearing. Many persons have been given shock treatments before their hearings. Many mental inmates are in wards because someone wants them out of the way, not because they want to help them. While regular hospitals must adhere to strict codes and procedures concerning a patient's rights, Mental hospitals are virtually immune to backup rights and protection. And things are only slightly better today than they were some time ago, as seen by this picture. To give you some idea of how things have gone, 27 states now allow mental patients to be sterilized against their will as of 1984 been estimated that many thousands of women have been sterilized against their will. So if you should get in a regular hospital and you have reason to believe you're a political target or any, on any state list, keep in mind, the signing of the blanket consent form means almost nothing legally. Because you still have rights in a hospital, but you'll have almost no rights in a mental hospital. A big difference. And if you allow a doctor to give you drugs or treatments, it is legal in a hospital if you give your rights away. Any invasive treatment, for example, which allows an invasion of your body with tubes or instruments and such can be halted legally in a hospital. 
And if you wish to leave a hospital, you can do so at any time. And anything done against your will is considered a battery under civil law. You can even refuse to enter in an intensive care unit if you're that far gone. But entering a mental hospital is a far different story. And to protect yourself once you're in a mental hospital is almost impossible because you're virtually at the mercy of the authorities ruling your life. And about the best defense 